Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Bard Graduate Center. I am Nadia Rivers, the coordinator of public programs, education and engagement. I am a black woman wearing black cat eye glasses. Um, my hair is dark brown and curly um, falling around my face and I'm wearing a pink and red shirt. It is um, colored on each side. It's a color black. I am sitting in front of my fireplace at home in New Jersey. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, welcome to the last conversation in the series, Disability Cultures, Creativity and Consciousness, curated by Dr. Tree Pickens. Um, before I go ahead and hand it over or introduce our speakers and do a little bit of housekeeping, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement, um, which was authored by Curtis Davia. While we have the privilege of convening virtually today, we also have the responsibility to acknowledge that many cities and institutions in America were founded on the exclusions, erasures, and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those whose land, Manahata, from which we are hosting this event. The land of the five boroughs that make up New York City are the traditional homelands of the Lenape, Merritt, Canarsi, and Matinecock, um, and Rockaway Nations. Despite systemic erasures, these lands persist as an intertribal trade lands under the stewardship of men, many nations and over 115,000 intertribal Native American First Nations and Indigenous peoples who currently call New York City home. In addition, I would like to acknowledge those here today whose ancestors did not arrive on these lands of their free will, whose tremendous cultural, economic, and technological contributions to continue to provide the foundation for our lives. I now have the pleasure of introducing and handing over the mic to Dr. Cherie Pickens, who works as a professor in English and Africana, and Dr. Akemi Nishida, who works as an assistant professor in disability and human development and gender and women's studies at the University of Illinois. Um, before they begin, I just wanna let you know that closed captioning is available uh, for, for today's conversation, and you can find that on the lower right hand of your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. My name is Cherie Pickens. Um, <clears throat> I'm a black woman uh, with the color of inside, the color of the inside of We Pred, um, but I'm wearing a little blush today. Um, and my hair is dark brown falling around my face with large hoop earrings. I'm wearing a gray shirt, um, also black cat eye glasses, but with uh, a lesser degree of tilt than Nadia's. Um, and I'm in front of a wall that is Pepto Bismol colored, very, very pink in my home uh, with um, a wall of books behind me. And I live in Maine. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with Dr. Akemi Nishida. Uh, we're going to be talking to you about disability art during the pandemic. Um, welcome, Dr. Nishida, how are you? Good, thank you so much for this great opportunity. I'm a part overwhelmed and part excited. So <laughs> thank you so much for Nadia and Dr. Pickens for this great opportunity. I'm a Northeast Asian uh, woman where tying my black hair in the back and wearing the pink sweater and sitting in front of a whiteboard, which is hiding the mess of my room. <laughs> and I'm, join I'm joining from the Chicago, which is a traditional territories of three fire people, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Bodawami. So again, thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. So um, one of the things that's that's really been uh, fascinating to me is that um, art as a as part of a natural process of human development is something that we often don't think about with regard to disabled folks. And so I'm excited to just talk to you about who you're watching, who you're reading um, in terms of uh, art right now. Who's who's most exciting to you? Yes, thank you for the question. And the part of me wanna kinda ask the question back to you, Dr. Pickens, as I wanna <laughs> hear what you are watching as well. Um, uh, so what I'm watching, what I'm reading, I'm writing about bed activism, BED, bed activism, engaged mm -hmm. by disabled and sick people of color. So I'm reading and, and then checking like Instagram photo or like mostly reading blogs and books um, by those who write about how they're changing the world from their bed. Mm 
So by bed activism, I'm thinking about that resistance and envisioning that's happening in the bed or from the space of bed that includes critique, critical analysis of the confinement that's taking place on the bed as well. So specifically, I'm uh, reading the work by Aurora Levins Morales, M-O-R-A-L-A-S, Joanna Hedva, H-E-D-V-A, um, or Leah Lakshmi Piepusna Samarasinha, P-I-E-P-Z-N-A-S-A-M-A-R-A-S-I-N-H-A, among other many, many, many other disabled and sick and neurodiverse mad, deaf, um, debilitated people who are, you know, resisting and changing the world from their bed. Um, and I, I think I came to be fascinated by, especially after the uh, Trump election in 2016, and we witnessed so much uprise, you know, throughout the nation. And also same time, like I experienced and I heard from community members how many of those direct action is not necessarily accessible or we don't necessarily have energy to go to all the protests we want to. So mm -hmm. I start thinking kind of bad activism or how people engaging in act, uh, activism from bed. And I'm not only thinking about those um, moment of like actively people engaging activism from their bed by writing a blog or doing internet work but i'm also thinking about uh, the time we spend in our bed because we are experiencing fatigue or pain or depression and i'm trying to write about you know what those moments do to us or like do to the world and um and I'm kind of specifically thinking about writings and works of artists uh, and activists of color, especially as you know more than I know, you write about it. I have, you know, people of color historically seen exclusively as a worker and a worker is often seen as exclusive or opposite of being disabled. And yeah. so I'm kind of trying to think about, but like what, when people of color are too sick, too disabled, too incapable, and then what's gonna happen, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny, um, a couple of, well, 10 years ago now, um, I was reading Rabih Alamedine's work, um, A-L-A-M-E-D-D-I-N-E. -E. Um, he has a, a collection of short stories called The Perv, and in it, there's uh, one person who is confined to his bed, that's how he describes it, and I think it's probably the least elegant of Alamedine's work, but um, what it actually does is talk in crude terms about bed activism. The person can't get up. Um, they are experiencing an illness, which contextually speaking, seems like HIV AIDS, but it's never actually named. Um, but that was my first experience thinking about what it might meant to write from the space of the bed. I did also read uh, Leah Lakshmi Peps, uh, Peps Peepsna Samarasinha's care work, mm -hmm. um, which just dumbfounded me. Um, as someone who can um, can write so clearly and eloquently about what it means to create. Uh, from the bed, from the space of the bed, what it means to create a world, how important that world making is, um, and what it feels like to expend all of your energy in an artistic space. Um, that was just incredibly, I think, hard hitting. The, the work is also very clearly um, written, very accessibly written. Um, and it, it introduced me to um, some of the other disability dance troupe. So Sins Invalid, um, <clears throat> which, you know, of course there is, um, there are others, but I'm thinking about too, someone like Alice Shepard, mm -hmm. um, who has all these wonderful videos on Instagram of her flying in her wheelchair. Um, so that is just incredible, I think, to, to make the link between what happens when you are of color, disabled, and um, too tired or too emotionally or mentally fatigued or um, just don't have enough 
spoons, right, to do um, anything other than be be in the bed. Um, I guess, you know, we've been talking a little bit about disability and, and art and art's been very, very broadly defined. Um, Cause we're, I mean, I'm now at this point thinking about dance I'm thinking about uh, world making in terms of plays, et cetera. Um, can you talk a little, little bit about how you see the two intertwined? Um, and you can feel free to focus on any, um, any form of art you wish. Mm -hmm. Um, before that, I saw on the chat that someone said that they can't find the caption button. Okay. Oh, yes. Is that being taken care of? Okay. So Nadia just said uh, they should appear to the lower right of that screen. So I hope that helps or, yeah, people can find the button there. Um, so uh, the, 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 about disability and art that's that's a broad topic and yeah. like <laughs> yeah yeah and it, i appreciate this opportunity to think about it so i certainly think about works by sandy e the yi or alison coppit k-o-p-i-t who write about uh kind of critically of art therapy or outsider art the kind of genre of art outsider art which uh, they kind of describe as tokenized and fetishized disabled people's art without giving credit or monetary credit and such. Mm. So that's, you know, one part of the reality. And also, but I personally love the art that speaks to or express crip wisdom. Mm. And by crip wisdom, I'm also including capital M, mad, capital D, deaf, neurodiverse, sick, trauma, wisdom. And I'm kind of using the word from, as you brought up, Sins in Ballet did the annual performance one year, which was titled as Bursting, Dying, Becoming Creep Wisdom. Mm. The people in the Leah Lakshmi's book as well, people use the word creep wisdom as a kind of like specific wisdom that emerges from disabled, sick, mad, neurodiverse, deaf people's everyday experiences. So I certainly, um, would, I love following the arts of that kind of represent or expand our creep wisdom. So certainly Alice Shepard is one, or I'm thinking about Caroline Lazard, L-A-Z-A-R-D, or Park Marcuser, M-C-A-R-T-H-U-R, and it's Tina, Constantina Zavitsanos, Z-A-V-I-T-S-A-N-O-S. So um, yeah, I kind of love also like when people bring like, like unex unexpected aesthetic that's kind of unique to the specific disabled person's body minds and also have a strong political statement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking a little bit, uh, very, I'm thinking very specifically about some of the things that Leah Lakshmi talks about in her work. So um, in terms of having crip wisdom, the wisdom to know how your audience interacts with you. So ensure, ensuring space at the front of the audience for folks who have mobility impairments, folks who are capital D deaf, um, folks who are mad to allow for people to walk um, around or move around during the performance. Um, that that is one way of allowing your audience to actually be fully present with you which is something that emerges from being in a body or being around bodies that um, are crit, neurodiversion, uh, deaf, mad, um, disabled, et cetera. And I mean, that specific example, as well as kind of allowing for how uh, dis disabled bodies move in a space for that to be understood as art, right? As opposed to something that, uh, you know, thinking about Sue Schweik and the the ugly laws, right? Um, that that uh, is usually sequestered away, right? And and with legal recourse to have done right. that, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, I guess a sort of follow up question would be for you: Can you think of um, specific examples where crip wisdom emerges that you think we might all need to be aware of? Yeah, so like kind of connecting back to the question of art, and I, I'm glad you talk about this exp 
uh, relationship between artists and audience. And I'm also thinking about art and disability in terms of accessibility or how open the museum or other institutes that kind of gatekeep our experience to art in one way, right? How those institutions include or exclude artists with disability or audience, mm -hmm. who audience or people who comes to museum who have disability um, is excluded or included. So I certainly see those like many curators as thinking how we can curate arts and performance by centering dis uh, disabled people's access needs or dependency and such. So that's, I think, one way creep with them um, become a kind of like uh, observable, like how accessible, how open, how inclusive those spaces are. And also I, I love uh, when people's art kind of embody creep wisdom of, um, on its own. So I brought up some artists name and I like their art because they often features things that's reachable uh, mm. by disabled people. So for example, it might be a reclining chair or uh, it might be a, a, this breathing device that you know artists might wear when they go to bed or um, so like, or like I, I am thinking about Caroline Lazard's video about um, you just see the image of the hands like uh, putting the medicine in the medicine box per day. Mm -hmm. So like that kind of is as part of the art form. Um, but these are like, again, like unique experience that are familiar and available only to certain uh, people with disability uh, who experience that. And I kind of love how people are paying attention to those moments and calling and claiming it's art and, you know, whispering that in the museum and other art spaces. Yeah, yeah and there's, um, there's a, uh, a particularity to that embodiment, right, that, that many people don't share, right? Um, mm -hmm. And for those that don't, um, their first impulse and their, their kind of culturally conscripted impulses to think of it as lack. Um, one of the favorite examples that I like to use um, when I'm in front of audiences that aren't familiar with disability is the, um, the brand OXO, uh, how it was started uh, by a woman who had arthritis. Um, and that brand um, makes it very clear that access is for everybody um, because most people like using the products. They're soft on the hands. They understand the way the wrist works, et cetera, all this other stuff. And um, it's a space where disability gets to be the source of creativity mm -hmm. um, and the source of um, the source of uh, uh, abundance rather than uh, the space of, of degradation. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that, that comes along with that is that um, dominant culture doesn't really recognize disabled folks as artists. Um, so, there's a, I was listening to the podcast, um, uh, It's Been a Minute with Sam Sanders, and I heard this description of this thing called quar culture, short for quarantine culture, and uh, the synopsis of it, I was listening, it was supposed to be about how our culture kind of um, went um, from the outside to the internet, right, mm -hmm. um, and the descriptions of why, the descriptions of how, the descriptions of what was going on, um, that those seemed like things people with disabilities have been doing for years, right? Video conferencing uh, with folks, having sort of morbid jokes about um, death and dying, really, you know, having open conversations about death and dying, thinking about the absurdity of it all. Um, and I just found myself sort of infuriated. I was like, they took our stuff and they're calling it something else. So, I mean, I'm wondering um, if you've got opinions on that or, or seen that phenomenon ha happen in, um, in other spaces. I mean, quar culture is but one example, but I think it happens quite a bit actually. Yeah, yeah, I totally, totally hear you. And as you said, I think this uh, pandemic time really 
highlighted creep wisdom and the, the wealth of knowledge that disability community, communities can offer, but many people kind of start doing it without without the historical backgrounds. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. about mutual aids or interdependence or care collective and all those things that um, disabled people and certainly people of different, uh, the race-based communities and immigrants, migrant communities, queer community has been doing mutual aids for decades and decades and yes. even centuries, right? Yeah. And then like now with a pandemic, people start doing it as if they discovered or invented or something. So I totally hear and see the connection about cool culture and how people also use different kind of tools and wisdom that disabled people in the community has been developing and have so much wealth and knowledge in it, like a mutual aids and such. So, so yeah, thank you for sending me, you know, in more info about core culture and for, I don't know if everybody have heard or read about it, but Alex Jung or Jung, J-U-N-G wrote about core culture mm -hmm. and they describe it as a, you know, internet as a site of collective art making. And by, in that way, they describe the core culture is egalitarian because as long mm -hmm. as you have a smartphone and internet, you can do TikTok and such and such. And also they describe core culture as like, describe it as everything, this is a quote, everything feeling kind of broken, including yourself, your brain is a little broken, end quote. So that's how kind of uh, they describe queer culture. So kind of, I wanna go back to the way how this person described queer culture, but like as you know, uh, Dr. Pickens said that internet has been always vital space of activism building, cultural building and world making for disabled people. I'm thinking like, for example, Second Life, that's like internet virtual world that many disabled people used to have uh, the feminist disability uh, social gathering, which Alejandro Ospina was organizing, or I'm thinking about gentle Heron, Heron, H-E, R O N organized annual disability conference in the second life. Mm -hmm. And in the second life, you can choose avatar that doesn't need to be a human shape. You can be a ball or you can be a uh, rub rubric, uh, no cube or anything. Like you mm -hmm. don't need to be a human shape, but that's kind of one example of how disabled people are making life and activism and culture and art on the online platform so again I want to emphasize that historical kind of like long history of that kind of internet collective art making and also I feel like a core culture as uh, the author articulated uh, opened up and gave tools to many disabled people I've seen disabled people using TikTok to describe ableism or TikTok yeah. to describe how can we add audio description on staff so I seen people are using it as a tool. And also I'm also, you know, cannot stop thinking about access measure or accessibility that's embedded in those new platform. So like who can participate, who can be part of it and who um, cannot necessarily do that. Yeah. And, and yeah, and also I'm fascinated by the way, how the Alex who wrote the article about core culture described the, the feet, one characteristic of this art is that, you know, everything feeling kind of broken, including yourself and your brain is a little broken. And that make me think a lot about, does it mean we are kind of relaxing with this super exclusive like social norm where disabled people are inherently excluded? Like, are we relaxing this social norm a little bit more and allowing um, not so cohesive, not so rational or not so lo logical way of functioning together. In the same time, I'm thinking about in what degree are we allowed to be 
not so cohesive right. or to whom it is allowed or on what platform we can be that but in what platform we are being punished if we do that right and also like is it going to continue after covid pandemic yeah right I mean, yeah um alice wong uh was tweeting about this earlier and imani barbarin uses tiktok a lot um b-a-r uh, B-A-R-I-N, um, Imani Barbarin. Uh, she's on Twitter and TikTok and mm -hmm. Instagram. She's everywhere. <laughs> uh, but she's been using it to talk about ableism. But Alice Wong, um, and that's W-O-N-G, um, they've been um, tweeting about this recently. So what we're going back to in mm -hmm. terms of where we, um, we as in disabled people, are allowed to be ourselves. Um, you know, if the pandemic is something we all can get over, then are the forms of art as well as the spaces of creation that have been that have sprung up, are those suddenly rendered invalid um, by virtue of moving on? Um, you know, it it, <laughs> it strikes me that, that that notion of the pandemic being over is 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 actually never ever going to be true um, in the sense that, you know, COVID long haulers, mm -hmm. people who have uh, side effects from having had COVID, um, the fact that we may need booster shots, that this form of, um, this form of impairment is gonna be with us uh, consistently. I think the question is whether disability is going to follow. Um, and that's the thing that I keep, keep thinking about. Um, can you tell me more about what do you mean by disability will follow? Yeah, I'm thinking about the social um, uh, the social model of uh, disability versus impairment. And I'm, I guess I'm saying this not for your benefit, but for people who are listening, um, you know, that uh, impairment uh, is what's happening uh, to the body mind and disability is how it makes cultural or social sense, uh, usually in a, in a negative way, um, historically speaking. And I, I'm thinking about the way that um, COVID-19 will have uh, continuing ongoing effects on people who have had it um, or people who, um, uh, people who will never be able to get the vaccine, et cetera. Um, and that you know, going back to quote unquote normal is a desire to have an overcoming narrative that would erase the impairment, but still make disability, that is that social cultural set of ideas still present um, in, a, in a particularly negative way. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, you know, we are still in the middle of it. So I can't really have like clear perspective or thinking or opinion about it. But I certainly think like how our understanding of disability as a category, identity, status, or body, mind, condition continues to keep changing mm. due to this COVID. And now there are more people who are living with impairment, right? What does it mean? Like, is it gonna force us to rethink what we count, you know, quote unquote counts as disability or not. And I feel like that's something also many disability studies scholars who do intersectional approach to disability has been challenging us already, right? And I'm thinking about your work as well about, you know, traditionally, historically in disability studies, when we think about disability as identity and such that often come from like over, over, overtly or over um, like a white disability rights, disability studies, kind of like theorization of disability as identity and such. And many scholars who studying disability from intersectional perspective say like, we need to acknowledge there are many disabled people who live with a condition, but who don't identify itself because historically they weren't allowed to identify or they're not really feel like included in the community. So, you know, kind of, we are building that moment in disability studies. And given that I'm really fascinated by how this COVID would 
like additionally, like further add twist to how we understand and think about disability? Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, very much an ongoing question. Um, and it brings to mind the way that thus far in this series, we've been talking about uh, ideological access. Um, and for folks who are a little bit unfamiliar, it's the idea that access encompasses more than just signing, signage, large print, you know, three foot doorways and hallways, specific kinds of lighting, um, but rather that access means that we specifically work to include disability cultures in an affirmative way. Um, spaces of, as you know, as we were talking about before, spaces of ingenuity and creativity. Um, you know, that, that, I, that ideological access is a hard sell for some people. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really hard thing for them to wrap their minds around. Um, do you think the pandemic might make that a little different, um, maybe in, in terms of leisure and art, um, because more people might be relating to it or might, you know, kind of think of it differently? That's, that's my hope anyway, if I'm gonna be hopeful. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm really fascinated and want to learn more about ideological access and what's their relationship to like collective access, for example, or like the kind of access that like a disability justice activist has been talking about, like access beyond legal, legally given access or beyond those physical built environment access. Um, so I'm thinking certainly about the ideological access and you know um, how and what kind of arts disabled people are creating during this pandemic and and I'm coming I'm not coming from art world at all I'm just a fan of art and I have <laughs> friends whose artists I love so much and I learn from them but when I if I we can think about art in really broad way as you kind of challenging people to do with this idea of ideological access. When I think about the art made by disabled people during the pandemic, that the first things came to mind is that the most important art, or I don't know if you can call it art, but is that disabled people making sure we survive together. Mm. And I cannot think of, I mean, yeah, I cannot think of more important or like, form of art making or life making we did during the pandemic is to make sure we all survive this together. And yeah. again, as someone who really never took my time to think about what counts as art and what not, so it might not count as art, but for, for most of us, like all we could do during this time was to survive, right? And make sure our friends and other community members survive too. So, I've seen many disabled artists like stop making art, but like starting a creep fund to make sure to raise money and distribute the money to other disabled people who need or mm -hmm. drop anything to do grocery run for each other or checking in with each other. So, so given with that said, when I think about access, I'm fascinated by the access that's enabled because of the kind of relationship we have, mm. right? So like what kind of access become possible because we built a certain kind of relationship between you and me and other people. Um, and access certainly should be kind of like guaranteed legally or access should be given no matter how much, like no matter how bad I am to make any kind of relationship or friendship, or no matter how hard I am the kind of person who you might find as like hard to hang out with. Like people should give an access period, no matter what. But at the same time, I'm kind of thinking about how disability justice activists talk about collective access um, and and also to the to think about access that's enabled by and because of our relationship is to also point out that uh, the access that are guaranteed legally and from government always have a limit. Yeah. You know, I think it's being said by so many people, like like you know, 
based on the, the structure of government, like what they give us is really limited or they won't give us access we need or access becomes a tool of surveillance and control for them. Right. So many people, again, thinking about mutual aid and I feel like that's one example to think about what kind of access become possible because of that relationship we, relationship we um, built. So yeah, when I think about ideological access, I think about that as as part of it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember at the start of the pandemic, there were a bunch of museums who, um, because people couldn't come in, they would walk, uh, like literally have someone with a camera walking through an exhibit, pausing, explaining, et cetera. And it was incredibly eye-opening to me to see these, um, these works of art through the lens of someone who was ambulatory because having been at the same museums, having seen the same exhibits, because I use the elevators, the um, narrative of the exhibit was completely different. So for me, ideological access has been um, something that would honor the difference that I bring in perspective from having to start literally inside the middle of an exhibit, right? Something like that. Um, and how that changes the story, how that moves things around. Um, and thinking about whether that continues, right? Because legally, it doesn't have to. Uh, even culturally, it may not have to. But if there's a commitment to justice, then being able to um, have a, a go through, I won't say walk through, but a go through of, a, um, of an exhibit um, would still make sense from a disability justice perspective. And, and, and you know, um, so many things are popping in my head. I think the other story I'll tell is that um, my first job um, in college, uh, the one that I had to use to like work study um, was in the museum. I couldn't be trusted in the library to put back books because I never had the strength. Um, but I couldn't be a docent because I couldn't traverse the stairs of the museum at my university, but I could be in the store behind the cash register. And that was an entirely different view of the museum, right? Mm -hmm. To have to rely on these oral retellings from patrons about how, you know, exhibits were and all this other good stuff. It just, um, uh, the physical accessibility and the ideological accessibility seemed to go hand in hand to me. Um, and when you're talking about mutual aid, I can't help but think about something like Patreon, um, that people began to understand the value of it, uh, that this is the way people get their, their food, their health insurance, their, their care, right? Um, and that mutual aids like GoFundMe, et cetera, and Kickstarter, that those were um, viable spaces to, to donate to folks if you were participating in being you know, their audience. Um, we're almost done with our portion of the Q&A and then we can uh, start answering questions from the audience. If you have any, I encourage you to put them uh, in the Q&A or, or raise your hand. Um, but I guess the last question for us is, uh, what do you hope um, is coming? Uh, <laughs> what do you hope is next? Um, and maybe what you don't hope is next, right? Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of like, like, yeah, like what we don't hope as a next. I feel like there are so many things that I don't want to go back to pre-COVID time, mm -hmm. right, other than COVID itself. Um, but what I wish lied ahead, I'm excited, kind of going back to what we discussed a minute ago, but I'm excited how disability arts or what counts as disability arts keep expanding because again historically traditionally we had a very narrow understanding of what counts as disability arts that relates to who counts as disabled people mm -hmm. right who can claim themselves as disabled or who can recognize as disabled person within the community arts or otherwise so as again many intersectional disability studies scholars expanding our imagination and understanding of who is considered as disabled or what considers as disability. I'm 
excited to see what kind of art become um, possible yeah. as we start thinking a disability more like broader, capacitive terms. Mm. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, I love that. I think, yeah, totally agree um, that, you know, that what what counts is is certainly more capacious and that and that there's an ongoing interest in it, right? As opposed to a kind of fad um, mm -hmm. that that occurs. So yeah, um, thank you so much. I'm excited for for the QA from the audience. Um, uh, Nadia, will you be handling the uh, the Q and A? Yeah, so I want to invite everyone, if there are any questions you have, to drop them in either the chat or the Q&A. Um, I wanted to start with a question that came up um, for me. Uh, I don't know if everyone in the audience is so familiar uh, with kind of broadening this definition of what um, being a disabled person is. And I think you touched on it, Dr. Pickens and Dr. Nishida, you just mentioned it a little bit of um, kind of expanding that definition and how um, everyone doesn't consider themselves disabled or everyone doesn't know that they're disabled. I just wanted to, um, if you guys could talk a little bit about what kind of things fall under that umbrella. Um, things that people, I think first, uh, Dr. Pickens, you and I talk about this glasses, yeah. um, the thing that is so an accommodation that so many people have, but we don't really consider ourselves low vision or um, blind. Yeah. Um, so I, I, <laughs> I was just in a conversation with someone about disability in the academy. Um, and I was making the case that there's so many more people who are disabled in the academy than actually uh, the statistics say, and there are some of us who acquired disabilities as a result of being in the academy, arthritis, carpal tunnel, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. Um, and so I'm thinking about those uh, conditions, those chronic illnesses um, as disabilities um, because they shape how you move through the world, how you eat, where you eat, when you eat, which is such a huge thing for disabled folks since eating is so social. Um, and then also um, how much you can actually do on your, on your jobs. If you've got a particularly high stress job and you've got hypertension, um, you're gonna have to reevaluate some things. So I know a lot of people think about that as just, oh, there's this thing that I don't talk about that I experience. And so they don't think of themselves as part of a disability community as, as having uh, a history and a culture that uh, is part of a larger collective. Um, until they get in spaces um, that are usually um, part of the medical industrial complex, sort of you know patient care groups, et cetera, that don't necessarily function as disability positive. Um, but yeah, you know, having a more expansive definition would allow some of those folks to understand their conditions as disabilities, and, and then perhaps also be able to um, receive the emotional assistance that they need from a community that understands rather than the kind of fix it um, idea that that's also, that's you know rather pervasive. And Dr. Nishida, I'm, I'm sure you've got things you want to add as well. Yeah, I, I said read Dr. Pickens' book. I think that describes it more than I can ever do in next five seconds. But um, so, so there are many disability studies scholars who is approaching to understand disability from intersectional perspective, including Dr. Pickens or Dr. Bailey and Mobley who wrote about uh, intersectional black feminist disability studies a uh, few years ago. But um, I'm kind of coming from historical genealogy of how disability historically is considered as uh, defined as those who cannot work, right? So disability often it's seen as opposite of people who can labor. And also disability often kind of hinges on the legitimation from the government because in that kind of whether people can get service and supports, public service and supports relied on if they're perceived as disabled by the government, right? So historically, many uh, people of color, whether at the time of slavery and then later on with like immigration and such, many people of color are exclusively seen as labor. So they are never 
allowed to take up disability identity or status by the government and other entities because they are again like seen exclusively exclusively as a worker, no matter what kind of disabling conditions they might be living with. And that and also you know disability rights movement has been um, kind of discussed over and over about its over representation or how its leadership or um, disproportionate disproportionately taken up by white disabled US citizens and that many disabled people of color, immigrants, disabled people didn't really feel that community as their community for that reason. So again, when it comes to like identifying as disabled, I often observe and I hear how people coming from different marginalized community have a very different experience of coming to identify as disabled and seen as disabled and such. Yeah. yeah, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. I think too, if you think outside the US and the UK, um, and if you think about the global South, the understanding of what constitutes disability also shifts because it isn't necessarily tied to labor, although in you know late capitalism, most things are. Um, it, it also is tied to your status in the community um, and what it is, how, how you're able to contribute and whether your contribution is compromised or enhanced by having a disability. Uh, that, that definitely shifts depending on uh, what part of the world you're, you're looking at. So um, just what you said opened up a lot of extra questions for me, but we do have a question from the audience um, and it says, can either of you recall an exhibition virtual or in space that you have visited that you thought was thinking about ideology, ideological access in a meaningful way? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still on this standing or try to grasp this notion of ideological access. So I might, my answer might not be point on, but I'll try. Um, I'm thinking about two work. One is I want to be with you everywhere. That's uh, uh, like three or four days event happened in New York City in 20. 19 spring, I want to say, and that was organized by uh, like disabled people, including Ali Shepard or Park Marcuser, Tina uh, Zabstanos, uh, Caroline Lazard, and Jerron, and all the people who kind of followed disability justice principles and teaching. So they kind of, how I saw it is they like use the disability justice principles to create this performance art event. And I think of that as kind of embodying the ideological access because they thinking access in really broad way. So not just having the space for people who use wheelchair so they can you know, just move into whatever the space they want, but they also like variety of different shapes and a different uh, the chair that's made of different material and different shapes and a different size. And they have this huge quiet space with so many tactile sinks in there and a different lighting setting so people can choose the corner to rest. And they thought about access by providing um, free Uber or Lyft ride for the people or paying for their door-to-door uh, -door paratransit, like access ride. Um, so again, they're thinking access in really capacitive, broad, diverse ways. So I think that's one of that uh, example came to my mind. I can think of places that have fallen short. I can tell you how. Um, so one of my favorite exhibits um, was at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas. Um, and it was a short-lived exhibit about Jean-Paul Basquiat um, and they had an amazing opportunity there to talk about madness, black madness in particular. I think that's 
part of what um, made me initially very fascinated with the topic of my last book. Um, but what was missed in that opportunity was to talk about Basquiat's process, um, his understanding of himself, um, and how that butted up against Andy, War Andy Warhol's understanding of him. Um, and I think there was an immense opportunity there to, to take very seriously his sense of himself in the world. Um, I also, um, uh, I was at a, was at the Picasso Museum in Malaga in Spain. Um, there's so many stairs. <laughs> so many stairs um so i mean i i get you know sort of the absurdist um bent to it um but i i think there was there could have been a moment there to lay it lay it out very differently um such that other folks could could have access to it um yeah i mean i i every time that i need to ask someone where's the elevator so I can go and I end up in sort of the bowels of somebody's museum. Um, that always is a clue to me that people haven't necessarily thought out, you know, how folks are, um, how folks are going to get around to see the art and what, uh, what makes sense. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking in particular of, of mobility impairments here, but there's so many other things that are missing for, um, folks who are neurodivergent, folks who uh, are deaf, who are folks of low vision, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't offer a model for how great it could be, but there's, um, those are some models for, you know, how, how not to do it next time. <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Nishida's example of I want to be with you everywhere is kind of that like one thing that exists. Um, there are very few things and that was a really, really great event um, and put together well. The only other things I can think of similarly is um, access programs at museums um, offering kind of packages that you can pick up for like um, stimming, um, like I think the Met has like quiet places in the museum that you can kind of retreat to for comfort. Um, a few events that I've been at, um, access events that kind of invite you to be as comfortable or walk around um, as you need. I think like attending lectures in spaces like that, um, if you can't sit through an entire lecture, no one's really thinking about that, but there is a major expectation to sit in one place and be quiet um, when attending programs, especially at places like museums. Uh, we have another question in the chat, um, and it is from a 2010 BQC grad. Hi, Colleen. Um, and the question is, I'm an artist and a full-time caregiver to an adult artist with nonverbal autism and ID. Um, writing a guide for caregivers on how to facilitate art sessions for adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, I lost my cousin with intellectual disabilities to COVID this year, and I'm dedicating my guide to her. Mm -hmm. Who should I read so that I'm rounding out my practical resource guide with more academic weight? Uh, Remy Yergu, uh, R-E-M-I-Y-E-R-G-E-A-U, Remy Yergu. Um, uh, their work may also be under their dead name. It starts with an M but your view is the last name. Um, let's see, and Lydia XZ, is it XZ or XY? I think it's XZ, right? XZ Brown. Uh, yeah, Lydia XZ Brown. Um, yeah, those are the folks I can think. Oh, Julia Miel Rodas, R-O-D-A-S. Um, and Leah Lakshmi uh, Peepsna Samar Sinha, who was also mentioned earlier, uh, those are the folks I would I would suggest. I would stay away from anything having to do with Autism Speaks. Um, <laughs> those are those are my suggestions. Yeah, I'm I'm reading the question again. So, like, writing a guide for caregivers on how to facilitate art sessions. Um, I, so many people, you know, in addition to the there are people Dr. Pickens pointed out, I again I think about the people I already named, like Caroline Lazard, who uh, thinks about 
like a caption or a different accessibility and how that's inherently embedded in the art making or well, Park McCursor and Tina Zavitanos thinks a lot about dependency through their art. So I think about their work. Also, Alison Coppit, who uh, just finished her dissertation, but her dissertation was entirely about how to bring disability justice ideology into cultural space and cultural work. And her dissertation was kind of written as a guide, like a guideline or like some kind of like a, a work book for the cultural workers, you know, whether the curators at the museum or artists themselves. So um, yeah, so these are the kind of people I came to my mind. Yeah, I mean, the thing about academic weight is that it only takes you so far because disability studies and disability in general kind of flies in the face of the academy you may find that disabled artists are offering more than academics on the subject. Um, and that the academics that you find are recent arrivals to the academy um, or folks who are in the academy because that's the space that has created a home for them, though it's not a, um, it's a, an uneasy fit uh, for most of us. So, um, you know, the academy may provide some weight, uh, but not necessarily all the things you need. So I, if you're thinking about folks with intellectual disabilities, I would say, think about folks who have intellectual disabilities who are producing that work, um, because that'll also, um, that'll also help. The academy is also like 30 years behind um, most uh, cultural phenomena. So, you know, if you do it and you get it into the right hands, it'll make its way into the academy. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to, to bring the academy in, into you necessarily. Um, and it, I am saying that as a, as a full professor and chair of a program, um, the academy is not <laughs> always the easiest place to be um, intellectually if you're thinking about disability. Uh, that brings me back to the thought I had earlier um, that I'd love to hear a little bit more from both of you as professors um, working through COVID um, and all of the kind of things that we think have come out of the pandemic um, in relation to access and disability, whether that's um, remote classes, um, asynchronous work, those kinds of things. Um, I'd just like to hear from you guys about uh, how that has improved or uh, any like barriers that you've faced as educators, both um, you know working with your students or for yourselves, um, Tree, as a disabled uh, educator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Nishibi, you want to take that one first? I'm still marinating over here for that one. So, so how that kind of new technological development and whatnot during the COVID expanded or not for our teaching. Um, so yes, I hear so many people are sharing the excitement about how Zoom meeting become the norm, which was totally denied before COVID. Like so many people requested, but it was denied or we are denied to work from home and such and such. So there are those kind of like um, infrastructure that were built because during the COVID that would, you know, beneficial for many disabled scholars and students. And yet I, I feel like it just never cancels out the extra stress and challenge, uh, especially psychiatric mental challenge and stress that brought to us and our students and I cannot think of how many times I cancel my class and I use my time to support students, make sure they have a food, make sure they have a place to live, make sure they can leave uh, domestic violence situations they're in. So I feel like this year teaching for me is always about care and caring, but this year that was certainly highlighted extra um, I feel like I was doing a lot of care work this past academic year to make sure all my students survive and survive okay. So that means we, instead of reading some academic works, 
I read or I, we listened to the podcast about NAP, uh, NAP ministry. I yes. don't know if you heard of it. Yes, the NAP ministry is where it's at. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. So like I assigned the podcast, um, the, the NAP ministry talks about napping and resting on the healing justice podcast. So I, my students, I listen to that and I just let them to take a nap instead of class and all that. So I certainly see a lot of care work that goes on this academic year. Um, yeah. So I'm going to try to answer that and, and deal with the multiple facets of my, of my job. So um, the first is, you know, thinking about my research. So the past couple of years, I've been um, endeavoring to, to write poetry. Um, and what this has meant for the poetry is that I've got a lot more quiet space to do that, a lot more. Um, I can deep breathe and go into where it is I need to be as opposed to needing to come home, disrobe, take off makeup, et cetera. I can just kind of breathe myself into a different space, which is um, a real benefit for poetry and for poets. Um, so that, that was helpful. I think also I realized how much I didn't know um, I mean, I think the, being um, a professional researcher, you're always asking more questions, but to really confront what you don't know about other people groups um, was, uh, it wasn't difficult for me um, and it wasn't a surprise, but I had the time to do something about it, right? Um, and so that was also really in incredibly helpful. Um, in terms of, uh, also being able to talk about um, some of these issues. I've been invited a lot more places because they don't have to pay for me to, to come, right? Um, you know, in terms of transportation and lodging um, and all of that. I mean, I still insist on honoraria, but you know, like <laughs> you don't have to go through all of those, all of that rigmarole. So that's also been incredibly helpful. Um, I brag that I've been to the UK several times this year, right? Um, so that's, that was, that was cool. Um, I think also, um, you know, in terms of teaching, I'm not very good at the pastoral care for my students. Um, what I am good at is connecting them with people who are, and I often tell them I'm not that kind of doctor, but what I can do, and, and, and I don't want to pretend that I am, because mm -hmm. there are people who have those skills, um, there are people who are trained, to do this work and I don't want to diminish what they do by pretending that I can do it just because I've read a lot of books and know a lot of things. Um, so I've been doing a lot more connecting than I have before. Um, my teaching has shifted in terms of the way that I grade. So what I realized was that the real important part for my classes was that students were learning. And in order to do that, they have to be able to screw up. So I instituted contract grading. Um, where students, if they do certain behaviors, they get a baseline grade and then they can work for something higher if they so choose. Um, and every, the default is contract grading. You have to kind of opt out of it. Um, also, um, assigning different kinds of media. So Dr. Nishida talked about podcasts. Um, for me, it's been podcasts, YouTube videos, um, to talk about economic inequality, I assigned Journey to Launch's um, podcast episode on uh, the racial tax in America. Um, I've also encouraged my students to watch the news, right? So rather than, because I'm, I'm at a small liberal arts college um, in uh, New England, in Maine, and they call it the Bates bubble for a reason. Students don't necessarily have to go outside. Faculty don't necessarily have to go outside and, and read um, and think about what's happening elsewhere. So having the news be a feature of the class. Um, I got a lot more organized. Having classes online and through a learning management system, make sure that every week can be scheduled. It's a really great rota for students to be able to, to go back to something very steady in a world where things don't feel as steady. In terms of service work, um, and this is uh, the confluence of the pandemic, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, uh, anti-Asian racism, et cetera, that um, folks have um, started to think about curricular reform 
So in terms of service to the institution, that that's also changed. And I'm hoping that that doesn't, um, that doesn't ebb uh, as the tide goes out. Um, and then also thinking about health and well-being, right, um, of my colleagues, right? As a program chair, it's my responsibility to make sure that colleagues at every stage, full professor uh, with tenure, associate professor with tenure, assistant professors without tenure, visiting assistant professors, that they have an idea of where it is they want to go. Um, and there are no graduate students at Bates College, but the students as well, that they have an idea of where it is they want to go and that I can help them plan to get there without judgment, without recrimination, just offering resources and um, a steady hand, right? Um, and, you know, consistently as a person with a disability, I am advocating for myself, that became a little bit easier once people realized that they needed the things that I have been advocating for for years. Um, and it also became a lot easier to say to people, I can't schedule something at that time, I'm going to see my therapist. And they would be like, oh yeah, absolutely. Keep that appointment. Yeah, we can reschedule. And I'm like, I wasn't asking permission, right? I was letting you know that in case you don't have a therapist, go get one, right? Um, <laughs> Or just to acknowledge the um, the typicality of having and needing and needing those kinds of professionals. So that's a long-winded way of saying pretty much everything about my job has changed, um, and in some ways for the better. Um, and in some ways, I'm tentatively hoping that they stay changed. Um, but those those have been some of the ways that the academy has has bent a little bit. Um, so that's that's been incredibly incredibly helpful. So um, as the final question, uh, Dr. Pickens, this is wholly inspiration from you. Um, action items, uh, the kind of things that you would like to see, uh, you know, to share with our attendees, just things that they can be thinking about um, from this conversation uh, in their lives, in their work, uh, from you, Dr. Nishida, as well, just kind of like biggest takeaways or anything like that that you would like to share. <laughs> not um, so hard i mean uh sorry in one of our um a, a workshop that we got to do with dr pickens i think that my action item uh was to make our events at bgc um more accessible um but for me in general uh in this last year, I thought a lot about how I identify um, and identifying as a disabled person um, and kind of sharing that more freely with people so that they become comfortable with it. I think people are really afraid of that. So that's been my own personal um, kind of action items inspired by you, Dr. Pickens. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I mean, I what what initially came to mind was the the collaboration, the spirit of collaboration with which Dr. Nishida works. I came across Dr. Nishida's work through Sammy Schalk um, and other collaborations that they've done together. I mean, we've met um, in person, I think maybe 10 or so years ago, but um, thinking about the fact that disability culture and creativity and consciousness, I guess to draw on the title of the series, um, is very much about collaboration. Um, and a communal understanding that we're all in this together. Um, and if you can't uh, find it within yourself to seek justice um, on behalf of the person uh, next to you, regardless of whether they are a comfortable person to be around, um, in terms of either how they relate or whether they have a disability or their culture, gender identity is different. Um, that if you can't do that, then we're in for a much something much worse than, than COVID-19. Um, so there's, there's that I think is an action item, but also I'm thinking about the fact that you've got uh, several of us here from very different disciplines all right, I'm in English and comparative literature and literary study, um, sort of an interdisciplinary humanist. And Dr. Nishida is elsewhere in the academy. And we're at BGC um, thinking about art, right? That there's nothing that disability doesn't touch. Um, and so if you're looking to find out about how it affects 
your life, you don't have to look far. And I think that's the action item that you start with the ways that this knowledge can immediately begin to make a difference um, in your everyday interactions. And then also the things you have stewardship over in your professional or personal life. Those are the things I think I'd advocate for. Um, action item suggestion. Um, so one thing I told my students throughout academic year is to prioritize your care, whether it's self-care or collective care before courses. And I said that as a professor. So like, if you need to take a break, let me know, take a break. Like always prioritize your care. And that's again, creep wisdom or what disability community has been teaching me about taking care of ourselves, our community is not like, it's a radical act. It's a resistance against capitalism, which tells us we got to deprioritize our well-being and our care. So my one thing is to prioritize your care, your collective and self-care. And the other thing is to kind of uh, thinking or piggybacking what Nadia said about accessibility and specifically collective access. So access should never be a solo responsibility of disabled person who need it, or it shouldn't be just fall onto a one person who's organizing an event. Mm -hmm. It's something we all can be part of, we all can participate, or we all need to participate in order to make the space as accessible as we want it to be. And again, I'm not only talking about physical access, but as Dr. Pickens brought up, like, you know, access can be temporal access, emotional access, financial access, mm -hmm. food access, informational, intellectual access. And again, it needs more people than just one or two people to enable and ensure that. So I wanna bring up collective access so we can each think how we can be part of making this space and event accessible for all. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, before we close, I'm just dropping in the chat um, the first conversation in this series uh, with Dr. Pickens, uh, Dr. Timothy Lyle, and Dr. Tamika Ellington. Um, it's a great conversation, uh, Post for the Ages, Against the Ages, and it is about um, fashion and disability. I encourage you all to check that out. Uh, thank you to our speakers. Have a lovely weekend, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.